Welcome to the Worldwide Center of Mathematics. Today, I'll be going over this week's Advanced Knowledge Problem of the Week. The full uh, problem and solution transcript, you can see the link in the description of this video on our YouTube channel. So this week's Advanced Knowledge Problem of the Week asks you to prove that the given um, Mobius strip, uh, parameterization for the Mobius strip, so we're trying to prove that the Mobius strip is not orientable. So the way that we're going to go about doing this is, so <clears throat> we're given, uh, which is not written here because of space issues, we're going to a given a parameterization R of U and V of this Mobius strip, which consists of variables where uh, L and R are real numbers, just constants, where L is between 0 and R, U is between negative L and L, and V is between 0 and 2 pi. So that's just a parameterization of the surface. And so we parameterize the boundary, so the boundary of the Mobius strip, so partial M, I'm going to parameterize it as P of T, where we have here um, this, this uh, function here, this um, parameterization there, and then we're given uh, the vector field f here, f of x, y, and z is negative y over x squared plus y squared, x over x squared plus y squared, and zero. So where t, or where, I should note here that this parameterization has t being between zero and four pi, because when we parameterize the boundary, we let t quote unquote go around twice, go around the boundary twice. So, okay, so this is a little bit of a longer problem, so I'm not going to go through every part of it. So we know uh, there's a part that's a little bit um, more simple, simple computation-wise, so I'll leave that to the viewer. It'll be, it'll be uh, gone through in the transcription if you have, still have questions about that. But so we know that, so we know that by Stokes' theorem, we, we know that the, um, the line integral, Stokes', Stokes theorem states that for an orientable CCPR surface uh, with boundary partial M, we have the um, line integral of f along the boundary is going to be equal to the flux integral of the curl over m. So by proving that the flux integral over m is not equal to the line integral over the boundary, we can prove that this surface m, where, Mobius, where m is a Mobius strip, is not orientable. So the part that I'm not going to go through fully is calculating um, uh, gradient cross f. Uh, but we'll find here that we cross the gradient with the f because, because we know here, we know that, so we're looking for over m the flux integral, uh, gradient cross f uh, dotted with n ds, ds here. This, is, this has to be equal to, by Stokes' theorem, uh, the line integral f dot dr over the boundary. So we know here that if we, if we do the calculation, which is in the transcription, the, the calculation of the flux integral here is going to give us zero. So we take, we would set up the, you know, we'd set up the matrix here with i, j, k, you know, partial, partial x, partial, partial y, partial, partial z, and then we set the component functions here in the uh, bottom row, and then we take the determinant of that matrix, and we find that everything ends up equaling zero. So anything we dot that with will also get a zero, and that integral is going to end up being zero. So we know that this is going to equal zero. So now what we need to do is we need to calculate the line integral over the boundary of f, and we need to prove that that does not equal zero. And we will find that, in fact, it does not equal zero. Therefore, we can prove that it, this surface is not uh, orientable, or not oriented. Excuse me. So, okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm first going to calculate p prime of t. So we know that we're going to need f of t. We're going to want to calculate f of p of t dotted with p prime of t dt. And then we're going to in integrate that over the boundaries where t is going from here from 0 to 4 pi, to 4 pi. Great. So first of all, I'm going to go ahead and calculate p prime of t, which is going to get a little bit messy, and we have to be careful with the positives and negatives when we're differentiating um, sinusoidal functions here. So OK. P prime of t, going step, uh, going component by component here. So we're going to use a product rule here. We're going to use a combination of the product rule and the chain rule for every one of these, except for the last component, in which we're just going to use the chain rule. So for the first one, um, okay. So for the first component, we're just going to go ahead and leave r minus l sine of t over two, and we're going to differentiate cosine t, which is negative sine t. So I'll put a negative sign out front here. So negative sine t plus it's going to be kind of all jammed in here. So plus, um, 
plus the, the time-dependent derivative of the first component so that the r will go to 0, and we're left with negative l over 2 sine of t over 2, and then we just leave the cosine t. So that's the first component. We're going to go ahead and do the same thing for the second component. So for the second component, we have r minus l. I'll just go ahead and write this at the very end when I have everything all written down. OK. So the second component, we're going to go ahead and use a product rule and chain rule again. So first of all, we're going to leave the r minus. So r minus l sine t over 2. And then we differentiate sine t with respect to t, which is cosine t. Plus, so then we differentiate the interior or the other function here. So we have the r will go to 0 because it doesn't depend on time. Uh, and then we have, we'll have negative, um, negative l over 2 uh, sine. Oh, excuse me. In both cases, it should be cosine over here because we have to differentiate sine so, uh, by the chain rule. So cosine t over 2 times uh, sine of t. OK, so that will do it for the second component function here. Let me make sure that I'm differentiating everything correctly. It's really easy to lose um, to get the signs kind of mixed up when you're, when you're doing this. So um, this L over 2 cosine, T over 2 cosine T looks good. R over L sine T. OK, great. So it looks like we're good to go so far. So we only have a final component here to differentiate. So we have L cosine T over 2. We're going to differentiate this with respect to time. And we end up getting uh, negative L over 2 sine T over 2. Because we differentiate the interior function here with respect to t, and we get 1 half. We differentiate the exterior function. Uh, and we get the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So we have negative l over 2 sine of t over 2. And this will be, oops, oh my goodness. Uh, this will be p prime of t. OK, so if we simplify this, I'm not going to go through all the writing on all the separate calculations here, because it can get kind of messy. But uh, so when, when we simplify this down, we'll end up getting here. We'll end up getting, for the first component, negative r sine t plus l sine t over 2 times sine t uh, minus l over 2 cosine t over 2 times cosine t. So that'll be the first component. Again, we have lots, just lots going on there. So the second component is going to be r cosine t minus l sine t over 2, so t, t over 2, uh, times cosine t, um, minus l over 2, cosine t over 2, times sine t. And finally, the last component will just stay as is here. So we'll just have negative l over 2, sine of t over 2. So what I just did there was essentially, uh, I just distributed out here I just distributed out the sine t and whatever the cosine t, and I just combined all of our like terms, and this is what we ended up getting. So this is going to be p prime of t. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and erase this up here. So now we have a couple steps left to do. We need to calculate, uh, we're going to need to calculate um, f of p of t, and then we're going to need to take the dot product of f of p of t with p prime of t, and then integrate. So first of all, we know that for f of p of t, we just need to plug in everywhere we see an x. We need to plug in the x component function, or the first component function here. Everywhere we see y, we, do for the second, we plug in the second component function. And everywhere we see a z, we plug in the third component function here. And that's of our vector field here that we're dealing with, f of x, y, and z. So we know that before we even start plugging anything in, we should calculate what uh, x, p of, x p squared plus y p squared is so that we don't need to do any messy calculations along the way. So, OK, so in order to do that, I'm going to take the first component squared. So that'll be x p of t squared plus y p of t squared. So we're going to square the first component function. So we're going to have r minus l sine of t over 2 cosine t all squared plus the second component, which is r minus l sine t over 2 sine t all squared. 
So what we're going to end up doing here is we're going to factor by grouping. So we notice here that we have this is the same term for both uh, the x component, or for both this term and this term, excuse me. And we have a squared here. And what we can do with the squared is we can take the squared uh, inside here. And then so we have r minus l sine of t over 2 quantity squared, and then cosine t squared. Same thing over here. Sine uh, t squared, or sine, I should put the squared here just for clarity. OK, so then we factor by grouping, because we have the same term here. So we'll end up getting um, r minus l sine t over 2 squared all times this plus this, so cosine squared t plus sine squared t, which conveniently enough just goes to 1. So in fact, we can just kind of ignore that part of this, because that's just a constant 1. So we're left with this as um, this as x squared plus x of p of t squared plus y p of t squared. So that'll be the denominator of each of these here. So now we're getting closer. So now I'm just trying to leave this information down here because we're going to need um, p prime of t later. That's why I'm leaving this here because we're going to need to take the dot product of p prime of t with f of p of t. Okay. So finally, or no, not finally, but we're getting, we're getting close. So what we need to do is we need to find f p of t. Uh, excuse me, yes, f of p of t. Okay, so negative y, so we're going to take the y component there. So the y component here is r minus l sine t over 2 all times sine t. So we're going to take the negative of that, so negative r minus l sine t over 2 times sine t all over uh, x squared plus y squared, which as we determined before is just this down here. So r minus l sine of t over 2 squared. And then the second component is going to be the x component here. So the first component, so we have r minus l, r minus l uh, sine t over 2 times cosine t. And this is all, once again, going to be over x squared plus y squared. So as we calculated before here, we have r minus l sine t over 2 squared. And then the final component is just going to be 0. OK, so as you can see, I'll just erase this here. So as we can see, this just simplifies down. Because we have in the numerator here, in both numerators, we have an l minus, uh, r minus l times sine of t over 2 uh, factor. And we have a, a common factor there in the bottom as well in the, in the denominator. So what we can do is we can actually just we can actually just cancel this out. So we're left with in the numerator. This becomes not a squared anymore. And all we're left with in the numerator here, canceling out that term. Don't forget the negative. We have a negative sine of t in the numerator here. And we're going to go ahead and do the exact same thing for the second component here. Same thing in the numerator, same factor in the denominator. And we're just, we just have a cosine t in the top in the numerator. So we're going to erase the squared, just uh, taking out one term there. And we're left with cosine t. OK, so that's significantly simpler than what we had before because we had some nice cancellation and then we had common factors there and everything kind of worked out nicely. So now we have two more steps. Last step will be very easy. This step, in fact, um, is going to, so what we need to do is we need to take the dot product. So if you remember, just to, to find our line integral, we need to take f of p of t dotted with p prime of t. So now we have p prime of t and we have f of p of t. So what we need to do is we need to take the dot product of these things. So that means we're going to sum up the multiples. So we're going to multiply the same con component functions. And then what we're going to do is we're going to uh, add them all together. And we're going to find what we get. So we should get a constant. Because if we remember, when we take the dot product, we're getting a scalar as an answer. So that can kind of get uh, pretty messy. Um, so in fact, I'm not going to go through every single step of that, because there's a lot of multiplying and multiplying and multiplying component functions. Again, that'll be in the transcription if you have any further questions about that. But so we're multiplying everything out, and we, we, we find that we have enough cancellation that essentially we end up getting in the numerator a factor of r minus l times sine of t over 2, and in the denominator a factor of r minus l, uh, or excuse me, uh, yes, uh, in the denominator we have the same factor, r minus l times sine of t over 2. So everything ends up canceling out. There's a lot of factor by grouping that happens, and we end up getting, so we have the same thing in the numerator, same thing in the denominator. We cancel out, and what we get, we end up getting here, is that f of p of t dotted with p prime of t 
is going to be 1. So now we know that we need to, in order to find the line integral here, so we have our integrand here, which is just 1. So we need to integrate uh, over the boundary, over the bounds of the boundary. So <clears throat> we have here for the bounds, t is between 0 and 4 pi. So t is between 0 and 4 pi, our integrand here, which is just 1, and dt. So we know that we just have a constant here, 1, so we multiply that by 4 pi. So this integral is going to be equal to 4 pi exactly. <coughs> Excuse me. So, okay, so now we know that the line integral along the boundary, uh, partial m, of our Mobius strip here is equal to 4 pi. But we also figured out before that the flux over the surface m is equal to 0. So there we have a contradiction because by Stokes' theorem, Stokes' theorem states that if we have an oriented CCPR surface um, with a boundary partial m, then we should get the flux integral. So the flux integral over m should be equal to the line integral over the boundary of m. But we found that this is, in fact, not the case. So we have just, dis we have just proven, in fact, that this Mobius strip is not orientable surface. Um, so that's it for this week's problem of the week. A lot of the calculations were not completely fleshed out in this video. Uh, but they're pretty straightforward, and if you have any further questions about them, you can respond in the comments, and I'll definitely answer all of any questions you have. And also, the full transcription will be available in the link in the description of this video. So if you have any further questions, you can see that as well. So if you would like to see more problems of the week, you can click on this here to see our playlist. If you'd like to subscribe to Center, to Center of Math's um, YouTube channel, you can click here. And if you'd like to visit us at centerofmath.org, click this link here. <clears throat> Thank you for watching.